We're doing this series that I'm calling Major Messages from Minor Prophets. Major Messages from Minor Prophets. And so we've covered a number of the Minor Prophets so far. You know, last week I wanted to say something this morning because last week we looked at Obadiah. And Obadiah, the subject was the family feud. I said that God is not about the family feud. And in Obadiah, God was punishing the ones that were creating the family feud, which was Edom, the sons of Esau. But I want to give you another aspect of this family feud thing, and, and it's between us. You know, as a church, we're a family. We are looked at as a family. And often within churches, people start family feuds in churches. And we start talking bad about someone or somebody we don't like too much. And sometimes we will begin to go on and on, and we will badmouth people amongst our own fellowship. And I want you to understand something. Um, we actually lost some people because of this sort of thing happening here. Did you hear me? Because people know that that's not of God. And that when you're gossiping about, talking bad about, running down people in the church, God is not about that. And so I'm just letting you know also to give you some heads up in this area because I, I said last week that when you begin to do things like that, the favor of God is going to roll, roll off of you. And the favor of God that maybe you once had, you'll stop having. You'll seek a healing and you won't get it. You'll seek things from God and you will not, you'll begin not receiving the things you pray for. Are you hearing me? We really can't afford to be that way. We have to lift up one another. And so when you're about to say something bad or negative about someone in the church, you need to turn that around and turn it into a positive. Um... And, you know, we, we need to learn how to do that because I believe that's where the blessing from God comes from. Um, we can't afford to be a church who that turns on one another. Jesus said, a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. That's what Jesus said. He said, a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. And so when we're doing things like that, we are a kingdom divided against itself. And then we as a church really can't stand. And I hope you're really listening to me because this is very important. And this is what I always tell people. When someone comes up to you to start running someone else down, grab their hand and say, well, let's go talk to them right now about whatever it is you have that you're not liking. Let's go talk to them right now. You hear me? Because also understand something. If they're coming and telling you this stuff, they feel comfortable telling you this junk. And it says something about you. Do you hear me? They feel comfortable telling you this junk, which might be saying something about you that you need to deal with. And so what you can do to deal with that is say, let's go talk to them right now, or let's give them a phone call, or let's whatever, and con you know, to contact the person so we can talk out whatever the issues are because, and try to make things well. Because we, you know, we can't be a people divided against ourselves here. There's too much stuff going on. We need everyone here. We need everyone working together. And we can't afford, really, having you guys speaking evil about one another. We just can't do this. And you will drive people out of our church. It's already happened. And you will drive people out of our church. Because they don't want it. People sometimes just don't want to hear this stuff. They don't. Some people know better. Okay? <laughs> and those people, when they hear you do this, they're going to go, uh-uh. You know, it, it, we shouldn't be talking this way. And so, are you hearing me this morning? In the name of Jesus, thank you. We're looking at the book of Jonah today, and I think a second thing we could look at is about God, and you heard me tell the young people, is that God gives second chances. And that's really what the book of Jonah is about. Jonah, I believe if you were to have polled all the prophets alive during Jonah's time about his story and what was going on, most of them would probably say he should be killed taken out. Prophets were no nonsense. They were tough. And if you were out disobeying God, they didn't have much compassion on you. I mean, the prophets were tough because when God spoke to them, they moved and they did. They didn't question. When God told Hosea to marry a prostitute, he did. Right? So, I mean, these guys didn't mess around. I and mean, they did what God said. If God said it, they did it. And, 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 and that was really the way they lived their life. When God said it, they moved. 
They didn't hesitate. They did precisely what God said. For them to hear about this guy that God said this, and you did what? You got on a boat going the other way? You tried to get out away from the voice of God? You tried, What? I mean, they, they would think that what, he, what Jonah did was crazy to do what Jonah did. Now, Jonah is very different from other prophetic books. Usually, prophetic books focus on the prophecies of the prophet. Usually, that's what a prophetic book does. It focus, and, this is, and the book of Jonah is among the minor prophets. It's right there among all the other prophetic books. Usually, these prophetic books focus on what the prophecies were of the prophets. But Jonah's just a narrative. It's a story about a short period of time in this prophet's life. And there's only like one sentence in the whole thing that's actually prophetic. You know, it's like one little sentence, one little blurb is a prophetic thing. And the rest of the book is the story. So it makes this book unique amongst all the other prophets, and the minor prophets. And so I'm going to start on the one. I'm going to read quite a bit today because I want to do justice to the book. And I think to really do justice to the story, you have to read the gist of all the story. And I'm going to start in Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. It opens, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. And cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish, the other directions, from from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare and went down into it to go with him to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He was trying to run away from God and Nineveh. Verse 4, But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone out down into the lowest parts of the ship, had lain down, and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots so we may know For whose cause this trouble has come upon us? So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, Please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation, and where do you come from, and what is your country, and what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea has grown more more tempestuous. Then he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know this great tempest is because of me. Down in verse 17, it says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. So this is kind of the gist of the beginning of this story. God speaks to Jonah, commands him to go to Nineveh, but Jonah hates the Ninevites so much that he refuses to go. He gets on a boat going in the opposite direction. In a way, you look at Jonah is the unwilling prophet. He's unwilling to do what God said. And so, and also, you know, it says a fish, not a whale. You know, people argue over that. It doesn't matter. It's some big sea creature swallowed him. And so, but this is, this is actually a story about God's patience, too. Jonah does not deserve a second chance. I told you, and I firmly believe, if you, if you polled all the prophets of his time, they'd have said, eh, you know, get rid of this guy. Uh, we need to get rid of him. Um, and so, you know, because they, they would have thought he would have deserved death. And so, you know, but in this story, we see God giving a prophet who doesn't deserve it, a second chance. It's really a story about God's love, God's patience. Because often we don't deserve a second chance, you understand. We, often we don't deserve it. But God is the God of a second chance. And that's really what the story is going to be about. And as we go on down to Jonah chapter 2, I'm going to read 2 two through 6 and then 10. It says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the fish's belly. And he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. 
out of the belly of Sheol. Sheol means the grave. You know, it's said really that Jonah died during all of this. That he was actually dead. Communication with God is a dead man. But, you know, that can be an argument back or forth, how, whichever way you want to look at that or not. Was he alive in the, in the belly of the fish or was he dead? doesn't really matter. Regardless, he's having conversations with God about this whole thing. And he said, I cried and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas. And the floods surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The water surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. You know, when Jesus gives the Pharisees a sign, See, he said a wicked and perverse generation seeks a sign. And then Jesus went on to say, I give you, I'll give you one sign. It's the sign of Jonah. That as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so I will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And that was the sign that he gave them. I've also heard it taught that, you know, in ancient Jewish teachings, it is said that in Nineveh, right before all this took place and Jonah came and preached, there was a solar eclipse also it was a sign to them that, you know, solar eclipses used to scare people. You know, it wasn't like, oh, let's all go and get our sunglasses and let's all. It didn't used to be that way with people. When they, normally, they didn't see it coming until it happened, and then it scared the heck out of them. They thought, oh, no, this is a bad omen. They thought something bad is about to happen, and this is the way the Ninevites thought, which is another thing they kind of opened them up so when Jonah came. Other than, like I said, we covered Jonah not long ago. Jonah was probably bleached white. His hair was probably, I mean, he's in the belly of a whale with, you know, acidic juices probably all over his body. I mean, who knows what he really looked like when he went there. He probably looked like a freak. <coughs> but anyhow, when, jo when Christ died, there was also an eclipse. And so what I'm saying, there's two signs in a sense that you could get from Jonah uh, that, 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 that the Pharisees would have seen. And so, but Jesus gives Jonah as a sign to that wicked and perverse generation. And so, and so you know... Um, and it's interesting when you see it, Jonah in the whale. You know, God's voice can reach you anywhere, folks. You understand? God's voice can reach you even in the belly of the whale. You're not, you know, Jonah went off to get away from God. Did it work? <laughs> it said it twice. That when he got on the boat going to Tarshish, he went out to, to get away from God. To get away from, of course, Nineveh, but also to get away from God. That was his mission, in a sense, was, and you know, and as I said, I think when we covered Jonah s several months ago, Jonah probably had good reasons to not like the Ninevites. I'm sure most of the Jews hated the Ninevites. They had been mistreated by them. Maybe, maybe people in his family were killed by them. It's really hard to say, you know, why he had such a deep animosity towards them. But I bet he had pretty good reason to have the deep animosity. But you understand, God will call you sometimes to go against your deep animosity. Your deep animosity is not what it's all about. It isn't. We think we have the right to make all of our own decisions. And folks, when God speaks to you, you don't have the right to make your own decisions. When God says, do this, do it. When God speaks to you, that's why I've always told you, even in here, God gives you a word for someone across the room, go give it. When God speaks to you and says, go tell this person that, do it. Go, whatever God tells you to, and I don't care if that's a person that you've hated for years. I don't care. It doesn't matter. Your animosity is not what it's about. God's mission is what it's about. His mission is what it's about, and that's what we're to be about. We're to be about what God's about. And even if he tells you something that makes you uncomfortable, that makes you want to go get on a car and go somewhere opposite <laughs> and pull a Jonah, I'm glad this kind of shows he gives second chances. But when God tells you to do something, guys, do it. Don't hesitate. Don't argue with God. Be bold. Step out and do it precisely what he said. Because you see, I think when, you, when you're that person, what you're going to do is you're going to open yourself up to miracles. You're going to see miracles take place. 
And it's worth it. It's worth it. it. Are you hearing me? It's absolutely worth it to do what God says to do. It's worth it. Even if you're not comfortable with it, do it anyway. It's worth it. Just go do it. Do it. Even if you have a history with a person and it's bad and it's, I don't care. It doesn't matter. When you hear the Lord speak, move. It says, in the, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. The same call. Same call as the first time. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey to go through it. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. And he cried out and said, Yet forty days... And Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the, Nin the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth. Now, even for Jews, this is what you do when you repent. They put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. Then the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout in Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast nor, nor flock taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. Let every one of them turn from his evil way, from violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Down in verse 10 it says, Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster. And he said he would bring that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Now here God calls him again, says, "Go to Nineveh, and and let him know." And and he gives him the word of the Lord to go in and to begin to to preach, and 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 he cried out. The only prophetic thing he says in verse four that we just read: he, "Yet forty days, Nineveh should be overthrown." The only prophetic, prophetic sentence in the whole book <laughs> is that that was the word of the Lord that God gave him to tell the people of Nineveh that 40 days they were done. That in 40 days they were going to be done away with as a city, as a, as a sovereign nation. They were finished in 40 days. And so, you know, normally when you're a preacher, okay, just for this way, and you're preaching to a congregation or a people, your desire is for them to be well, to get saved, for good things to happen to them, right? I mean, normally when you're the preacher, your desire is for people to be blessed by what God gives you to share with them. And wouldn't you say that that's 99.99% of the time true? I don't know. This might be the only time in Scripture I think it is that it's the exact opposite. He's preaching to a people that he wants to see destroyed in 40 days. Okay, you hear me? <laughs> He's given them the word of the Lord, just as God said. Okay, he said, okay, God, I give. The belly of the, the fish and oh, whatever, I'm done. I'm just going to do what you told me to do. Okay, God. And so, he, so you can see he's probably haphazardly, you know, not with all of his heart preaching, right? I mean, he's not really preaching a heartfelt message that he really wants them to do. He's really preaching the opposite of what he wants them to do. He's preaching the opposite. He wants them destroyed, and he still wants them destroyed. And so, here's, I mean, just imagine this is a preacher that goes out and wants his congregation destroyed, wants the people that are listening to him preach. I mean, this is a weird book, really. It's really strange. He wants these people dead, all of them, from the eldest to the least. He wants them all dead. That's what Jonah wants. He's preaching a word to them to save them, but he doesn't want them saved. Isn't that odd? It's like, isn't that like weird? And I'll, I'll add this to that. Can't God use anyone? Now, you've heard him use a donkey, right? Talk to someone and save their life. Can't God use anyone? Truly, God can use anyone. Really? I mean, there's no one God can't use. Nobody. No matter how even unwilling they are, He can use them. 
In so many ways, this is such a beautiful story of God's grace for the Ninevites, of course, for Jonah. God's grace is all over this book. Really, it is. God's mercy is all over this book. You know, God could have just tapped the next prophet who would have gone straight to Nineveh and done it. You understand, there's probably hundreds of prophets that would have gone straight to Nineveh and done exactly what God said without any issues. They would have disobeyed. But see, God chose the disobedient prophet on purpose, I think, so that we can get this book. God God didn't choose Jonah by accident. He chose Jonah on purpose because Jonah was going to do exactly what he did to reveal his grace and his mercy. That's why he chose him, so that we would have this story that, that is such a beautiful history and such a beautiful telling of God's grace and mercy that's available to us, too. This is the God who loves us. He's the God of second chances. He's the God who, I don't care how many times you mess up, how many times did Jesus say to forgive? Seventy times seven? You know, that's the kind of forgiveness that God has. He forgives us over and over again, right? It's really quite amazing. But see, Jonah was chosen on purpose. He was chosen on purpose so that this story would be. Because God could have easily chosen a prophet that would have just obeyed. There was like, that was 99.9% of the prophets out there would have just obeyed God and not done what Jonah did, okay? <laughs> I mean, you, you, you hear me, right? You understand what I'm saying. God chose him because he was disobedient. <laughs> That's why he was chosen, because God could have just tapped the next guy. He'd have gone straight there and preached it. They'd have gotten saved and everything would have been fine. But you wouldn't have had much of a book, really, you know. But we got this narrative story, this beautiful story of God's grace, his mercy, and his kindness because of this prophet who was disobedient, who did not deserve the grace and mercy of God. But he had it anyway. He had it anyway. And so it's pretty phenomenal because you read here in chapter 4, the last chapter, verses 4 through 11, because, you know, God did not overthrow the city. God, you know... Jonah's still going to wait out the 40 days hoping and praying that they do something wrong and God destroys them. So, but, you know, it, it, they're, you know, they're not destroyed. They repented. And so God relented. And it says in verse 4, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. <laughs> Jonah's angry. Why? Because they repented. They listened to his word. They obeyed his sermon, and he's angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, oh, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. What an interesting fellow. Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? The Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? I mean, God's looking at you. What, is it right? Is, is it righteous for you to be angry? So Jonas went out of the city, sat on the, the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade. So he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a plan and made it come over Jonah so that it might shade, be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant, but as morning had dawned, the next day God prepared a worm, and it damaged the plant so that it withered. And it happened that when the sun arose, that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he drew he grew faint, and he wished death for himself and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah again, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, It is right for me to be angry to be angry even to death. But the Lord said, You have had pity on the plant for which you did not labor, nor make it grow, which, which came up in a night and perished in a night. Should I not also pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left? I always love that part where 
it says, because it doesn't cover it as much earlier. You know, Jonah, when he fled to Tarshish, it's because he knew how merciful God was. Jonah knew that God was merciful. So when he fled to Tarshish, he fled to Tarshish because God was merciful. And he realized that if he went to Nineveh and preached, they would probably get saved. He realized it. I think there's a part of this book of Jonah that we really need to see and pay attention to. And that part really is sometimes we become very much about our own thing. We care more about what we care about than what God cares about. You see, Nineveh was a wicked city, a pagan city who didn't, you know, we have to say, didn't really deserve to be saved. They served foreign gods. They they were not a they were not a God fearing city. But in this story we see that God still had compassion on Nineveh. Jonah had none. But God had compassion on Nineveh. You know, sometimes there's people in our life that we will that person doesn't, doesn't deserve God's grace and mercy. Right? Come on, you've met them. They've been mean to you, right? Come on. You know, they've been mean to you. And in our own heads, we say, God doesn't, that person doesn't deserve God's mercy. This story tells us that God has mercy on the wicked, on those that don't deserve it. The ones that we look at that don't deserve mercy, you know what? God is merciful. God wants to show mercy. Do you understand this? God wants to show mercy. He desires to. Doesn't matter what you think about someone. Doesn't matter. You need to know who God is. You need to know who God is. Because God is a God of love and mercy. He wants to show it. He doesn't want them destroyed. You might want them destroyed. God doesn't want them destroyed. You need to know this. You need to understand this. This is the God that we serve. There's written so much, so, you know, so much of these minor prophets so far has been giant displays of God's love. Jonah is like the biggest, I think, in so many ways. God's love and mercy and second chances to those who are supposed to be serving him. God's love and mercy and second chances to those who don't serve him. That's what this book's about. It's about God's love and mercy really towards everybody that's available. It's there for everyone who repents. Is God's love and mercy. We need to not be so much about ourself and what we think in our own judgments. Are you hearing me? See, Jonah was all about his own judgments. He wasn't about God's judgments. He was about his own judgments. He wanted his own judgments carried out, and if God said they're destroyed in 40 days, that's what he wanted to see, and period. We need to learn the lessons from this book. We need to learn just, you know, guys, you might be working with someone or someone's in your neighborhood that you just can't stand. You maybe you just can't stand that person. I mean, if, they, if you see them in the grocery store, you walk the other way. You just don't want to face to face. You want nothing to do with them. Like Jonah, God might call you to be the one that leads them to Christ. Like Jonah, God might call you to be the one that leads that person to Christ. You're to be the one that extends the olive branch and love and mercy and kindness as a display of His first. God might be leading you to do that. This Christian walk, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing. As we're walking in this walk, we're supposed to be becoming more like Him. <laughs> That's really what it's about. As we're walking this walk, we're to become more like Him. What does that mean? That means that grace and mercy we talk about, that we see in Him, needs to be birthed in us. Birthed in us. 
needs to be. I was like sharing the story of this elderly couple. They both passed since. They used to come and they told the story of the neighbor who killed their dog. And, you know, treated them horribly. He was not a Christian, of course, and they were. And, and how they continued to love him regardless, and they got to lead him to Christ. You know, that's just a great story to show even the things from this book in a sense. The gist of what this book is about. You may be the only way that God ever, someone ever sees God's love and mercy is you. You might be the only person around that person that's really seriously serving God. That takes it seriously. It may not be anyone else in their life where they could actually behold or see someone serving Christ except you. Be that one. Be that one. Surprise them. Show them the love of God even when they know they don't deserve it from you. Show them the love of God anyway. Why? Because that's God. That's what God does. It just is. That's what God does. Please stand to your feet this morning. Jonah's a great book. Next week is Micah. So we begin to look at Micah. And Micah, some good stuff in Micah. A lot more prophecies in Micah. So, <laughs> Lord, we just give you thanks and praise for who you are. We thank you for your tender mercies, Lord. We thank you for your grace, Lord, and the love that you show, even to those of us that do not deserve it. We thank you for it, Lord. I just welcome, Father, to follow every person in this room. Holy Spirit, follow them all home. Follow them into those situations around those certain people that might pop up in their life this week or the next few weeks, this person that will pop up. May the mercies, the love of this book be remembered during those times. So that, Lord God, we can begin to show your kindness, your love, and your mercy, even to those that do not deserve it. May we be more like you, Lord. May we be more like you. May your kindness, your mercy, your love just flow through us, Lord. May we be vessels that carry it into our lives, into our neighborhoods, into our workplace. Wherever that we are, Lord, may we carry it. May it shine through. And may, th may they see you in us, Lord, I pray. So, Father, I just give you thanks for everyone that is here. And, Lord, I just pray, Father, that as a people you would make us one. Help us to love one another the way you have called us to. Even the people that we may not like a lot, help us to love them anyway. Help us to walk this thing out. Because, Lord, I want your, I want your blessings poured out upon everyone in this room, and I want, Lord God, uh, every person here, Father, to be under total divine protection and divine healing, Lord God, in everybody's life in this room. And, Lord, we give you thanks for it and praise for it in Jesus' name. May the Lord bless you and keep you, and may his face shine upon you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon each and every one of you and grant you his shalom, his perfect peace. God bless you. If you need prayer this morning, we're up here, and elders will be up here too to pray for you. If you need anything, uh, just come on forward, and we will pray for you. If it be a financial thing, if it be a physical need, we want to pray for you and see God do a miracle in your life. God bless you and keep you.